We're live. All right. Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to the October 2019 Wikimedia Research Showcase. I'm Jonathan Morgan with the Wikimedia Research team. And joining our team today, we have two guest researchers who are going to be presenting around topics of uh, information, uh, disinformation, and uh, information um, integrity on Wikipedia, uh, Fabrizio Benevenuto and Francesca Spizzano. And first up today is Fabrizio, and I'm going to hand uh, hand things off to research scientist Diego Saez Trumper to introduce Fabrizio's talk today. As usual, uh, Isaac Johnson uh, will be staffing the IRC channel and uh, monitoring it for questions. So if you have any questions on the IRC channel, you can ping Isaac. Um, he'll also be monitoring the comment thread on the YouTube stream. And with that, I'll hand it to you, Diego. Thank you, Jonathan. So uh, with, with this uh, research showcase, we are starting a series of, uh, of different sessions that we want to cover topics about disinformation. Disinformation uh, is uh, one of the, of the main topics that we are starting to cover as a research team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And on these talks, we will be covering topics related with Wikipedia. But also, we want to learn from other experience uh, in other platforms and how attacks uh, of uh, deliberated spreading disinformation are being done there. And this is exactly what the first talk will be about. So Fabricio will be talking about uh, the different techniques of uh, spread disinformation uh, during the Brazilian uh, uh, presidential campaign and, and how they have built some tools to help uh, fact checkers and the community in general to, to fight against disinformation. So for me, it's a pleasure to present uh, Fabricio uh, that is um, presenting from, from Belo Horizonte, uh, one of the nicest places that I've been and one of the best universities that I ever uh, collaborate with. So Fabrizio, thank you for being here and please, whenever you want to start, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Diego. Thank you all for, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about what we have done uh, along the last year and this year here in Brazil. Let me open my slides, just a second. And okay, done. Can you guys hear me and see me? See the slides? Okay. So, uh, this, this, basically, we have created here in Brazil uh, a project uh, that we call it Elections Without Fake. Uh, it was not... Uh, able to counter fake news uh, uh, in, in the, at all, right, in the entire country, let's say, we had an election full of fake news, uh, but, but we learned a lot uh, how they acted here, and there were some, some advances uh, based on, on what we built. So basically, there is one, one, main, uh, uh, one main thing that, 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 that we changed as researchers here in these uh, in this in, in this project is that the way we were approaching misinformation in the past for example trying to counter bots or something like this we were monitoring elections and dealing with the problem uh, after it already happened and and, and the elections and this counter misinformation in election is a kind of adversarial fight you have some some uh, some uh, uh, campaign, some malicious campaign or misinformation campaign happening in one election and in the other election you can somehow learn with, with the lessons you learned from, from the previous election or from, from elections in other country and try to prevent those things to happen. And, and somehow uh, um, we were missing this kind of, of initiative, at least here in Brazil, where we knew, uh, at least we, we knew part of, of what happened in US and in other elections but there was no initiative here to counter, to, to build something to, to, to deal with the problems that we already understand. So that was the main motivation. Instead of, of doing the papers 
uh, only the papers, the scientific work on, on what happened in Brazil, we decided to make something very different. We decided to launch systems that could really help uh, uh, to counter fake news and and this counter misinformation to, to be more 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 precise. And and this this was a big change for us and I will try to explain. So it was not our, our actions sometimes here were not too much on on the papers. They were more on opinion letters and things like this. And now in this year uh, we are we are publishing much more papers telling these stories. So let me let me explain first what, what kind of motivated us to create these systems. Basically, what we saw from the US election, we, we saw this possible interference of, of Russia um, in the election camp, uh, in, the, in the election in the US. Quite uh, we, we found this this could be very complicated here in Brazil. What what we saw here, here you can see three images, three ads that we extracted from this. this uh, these are ads that were released by the, the House of, of Democrats in the US. They were launched by a company in Russia and, and among with many other ads uh, that they release uh, uh, at a certain point. We studied those ads, more than thousands of them, and, and if you see Part of these things are, are, are fake news. If you look at the first one, this is clear, clearly something that Barack Obama already already uh, has has debunked. Uh, but the second one is like I, I didn't believe in the media, so I became one. It's not it's not necessarily something uh, that is fake. It's more something that attacks the media at all, right? And the other one is like a man, like associating religion with one candidate and the other. It, it's not exactly some 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 fake news, it's, it's just a meme or some, some joke or something, but has influence in the campaign. So the, the term fake news, sometimes it, it's, it's overloaded with a bunch of things. Here we just, we're just, um, we just saw this, this scenario, this, this, this Facebook ads um, as something that could be huge abused uh, in, in our election in Brazil uh, in, in 2018. So what, uh, let me clear, uh, just, just explain how this, this Facebook ads work before we explain what we did to try to, to help to prevent these things to happen here in Brazil, uh, um, especially thinking about external interference or someone trying to launch a lot of ads attacking one candidate or not and, and, and so on in this platform. So basically to launch an ad in Facebook you basically what what you need. Here's an example of my hometown. It's a small town. I can choose to launch an ad in in that hometown. This is these are pictures from the Facebook ads uh, platform, and I can choose the age. I can choose um, gender. I can choose a bunch of other things, um, uh, like even salary or religion, things like this. And and then Facebook says, okay, th this is the the audience size. Uh, for 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 you to target and advertise on on these people with this this profile, right? So what we we have played with is that there are here in this part uh, around one hundred and one thousand and one hundred attributes that you can combine to create uh, an ad, and and here you have you have much more have a huge amount of attributes that you can you can combine. And these things are behavioral or interest that people, based on things that people uh, like it. And you can see here, addicted, evangelicalism, same-sex relationship. These are very, uh, you know, things, things that, that could be exploited by some malicious campaign to target any specific people and, and somehow divide them. And we did this study uh, with, I, I didn't introduce my collaborators, I will do uh, with, with the reference to the paper. So we did this, this, this paper with people from Max Planck and some other institutes as well, uh, where we tried to characterize those Russian ads released by the House of Democrats. And, and what we have found is that the topics are not, the, the, the ads, they are divisive. They are not necessarily fake news. They are not necessarily uh, supporting one candidate or another. They are divisive. They touch in, in things like race, 
religion, and so on. And that's that's probably maybe this is this is part of the reason we have such a polarization in all the elections. We have people are discussing and 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 so such divisive topics. Uh, and, and sometimes these things are even people pay to reach other people with their uh, with these divisive topics. And and it, it's impressive high the, the click through rate on this on these ads ten times higher than any typical ads in, in Facebook, which is already pretty high. The ads in Facebook are receive very high click through rates, and here ten times more is, is a lot. And these those ads were posted along three years. It was not just close to the election. This was something. Uh, they were playing for a long time. We put all these, uh, these ads, if someone wants to take a look, in, in this website, and, and we have crawled, uh, uh, we have kind of, of reproduced what what was the target, because they had the, they released also the formula of the ads, the, the target formula they used in, in the ad platform, so we could reproduce what is the demographic they were targeting, and, and so on. This is to this it has a lot of results. I try just to summarize because I want to make the point of, of, of how, what are the systems we could build to try to help elections. And what we tried to bring to Brazil was the following. We tried to create a, a, a plugin and make people install a plugin that would crawl their ads. And so anyone that installs this plugin, and, and this was developed by, by people at Max Planck, they, they um, we have used their plugin here and just adapted to, to Portuguese and to Brazil. But basically, anyone who installs this plugin, this plugin will give us, uh, will, will volunteer to give us their, their ads, the ads they receive in Facebook. And, and this is open source so that anyone can see that we are not crawling anything else, just the ad. And, and then we are making, we are opening a data set of ads, uh, a database of Facebook ads and their targets and so on in, in, the, in a, making a public data set that anyone can look. This is basically to provide transparency. We thought, okay, if anyone makes something that is fake or, or, or is trying to, to attack someone, now there is a way to, to, for someone to, to say, okay, this happened, right? This, this candidate attacked this other guy, or this other page is attacking this guy, and this shouldn't be happening, and so on. We should track, that's, that's the idea, to bring some transparency. And, and the other action is try to start a debate about, about the use and abuse of these kind of platforms, and, and say, okay, this was abused in the US, how these things could, could, could be changed here in Brazil. We, we managed to have around 2,000 people who installed our ad, our 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 plugin, our uh, our crawler plugin? Uh, basically, there was, for example, I, I could mention here a BBC article who talked about our our plugin and saying how how people would would help to provide transparency to this space. So people understood that and installed it. So 2,000, it's quite a lot. Uh, although it's just a sample of, of the entire Brazil, a very small sample, but at least we, we would have, we could see if something wrong was happening inside there. Here's an example of an ad and what we crawl. So this basically says who is the advertiser, the page who paid for, for the ad, and when it was someone saw that, right? We don't, we don't show who saw the ad, right? But one of the volunteers who installed it saw, and this is basically the content. Sometimes we have image or video or something else here. In this case here, we just have a text. And here's uh, an explanation about uh, why you were targeted by, why did our volunteer was targeted by the, that ad, right? And this is something that, that Facebook provides when you click in the ad and see why I'm seeing this. This is basically that button. So, so the second step was at, at a certain point when we released all these things, uh, it was a bit disappointing uh, to see what, what Facebook said and what, what even our government was saying. So for ex Facebook was saying that, okay, uh, we plan to make this kind of database uh, uh, in the future. We are, we are planning something for US and so on. We, we, don't have plans, we don't have time to make it for the Brazilian elections. Basically, that, that was it. They liked the idea. They were planning to make some, something very similar, but not for uh, 
before our elections. And 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 the government, the the, the agents that is responsible for elections, they were saying that uh, they they should not try to track those things. But but if someone points out an an, an ad that is that is against the law, uh, they 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 would do something. So they they just react. They don't try to find things that are wrong. But if someone okay complains, they can react. That's that's also uh, strange because for for ads here in Brazil, in TV and in radio, uh, usually uh, there is some some a lot of rules. So if someone makes an ad uh, as in, in TV, right, you can track who made the ad and and you can you can complain uh, uh, that 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 those ads shouldn't happen or something like this. But inside the social media, there was no. The rules are not so clear. So we wrote this this article here uh, on one of the main newspapers, uh, kind of saying that that without without this uh, this this without providing transparency, uh, there is no way for for the electoral justice in Brazil to track who paid for that ad and and who is is kind of trying to interfere in the election. And and there is one detail that I need to mention here in Brazil. Uh, it's not it's not allowed to make any uh, uh, to make a political ad too close to the election. Only the candidates and the political parties. If someone wants to make an ad, they actually they need to donate the money to the political party, and then the political party will do the ad and 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 reg register how much was spending the social media. But then there was no way to track how much was spent, and Facebook has no no. Uh, uh, has the right to, to not show who paid inside uh, anything inside the, inside its platform. So that's that's basically what we were trying to make people to convince people, and we were expressing our concerns in, in uh, as opinion letters. And at a certain point, uh, I was invited to give a talk in the Senate and express those concerns there. And at a certain point, a lot of other people were talking about the same concerns. So we kind of push this, those concerns to the society. And and the change came. So so Facebook has kind of in a hurry implemented the same kind of database we were doing, but but for before the, the elections here in Brazil. So the elections were in October, they were able to deploy the same kind of database of political ads in July. And and there is one extra thing. Uh, they made some agreement with government in which uh, anyone that that wants to make an, a political ad need to register first with some sort of a social security number or the same kind of number for the political party, so that the money they spend inside Facebook would be tracked and 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 accounted. So how much they spent in, inside inside the platform was something that was that became public, right? Here I'm showing an example of uh, the ad was also identified as political political propaganda. So I'm showing here an, an illustrative ad on one side, and the other side is actually a real ad that, that was correctly done along the election. And all those ads that were correctly done, they went to the Facebook database. One, one problem, these ads, okay, I need to say, this was fantastic, and, and really, I think this really helped to protect uh, this space along the Brazilian election. Otherwise, it would be like a chaos because uh, as as companies or or individuals cannot pay for for ads along the the, the electoral period, I think I think without this kind of protection, a lot of people would would do, and and this this would be some sort of a crime, right? Just as 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 by law, they couldn't. So. What we are doing right now, we didn't finish uh, so far this, this research, uh, is that we are contrasting our database with the database from Facebook. And we already have found, have found like, let's say, a few uh, ads that are against the law. Uh, and and, and that's, that's something we, should, we, we, are, we are considering here, how we are going to report this. So, okay. Moving to the second big problem here in Brazil, uh, at a certain point, uh, we we were leaving the elections, right? We we basically let, uh, everyone here in Brazil 
has used WhatsApp. Let me just bring some context about this. Uh, basically, SMS messages here in Brazil, in, they are they are paid and they're not that cheap. And, and, and when WhatsApp was created, immediately everyone saw in WhatsApp a way to not pay for SMS messages. And then, and then after that, WhatsApp has evolved and you have free calls and so on. So WhatsApp is basically a, uh, something everyone with a cell phone use WhatsApp in Brazil. And, and then a lot of people, uh, uh, so we were receiving uh, memes and fake news through WhatsApp in family groups, uh, groups of neighbors, or any, 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 anyone were involved in some groups. And, and these things come out here in the group, like memes and, and, and so on. So how can we track something inside WhatsApp? It's not even a social network, and everything is encrypted end to end. So, so how can we make something on this space? Because it's, it's clearly being abused, but, but, but there's no, no, no way. What we, we try to do here, the unique thing we could do is to monitor public groups. Public groups, there's not a, a, a definition, a clear definition about what is a public group. We created this definition. Basically, every, any group that is publicly accessible, when you create a group, you can create an, a new URL and share the URL in the web. So any URL that was indexed by Google or Twitter or any search engine uh, and, and anyone can join, uh, we were trying to, to connect on those URLs and, and join the, the groups. And basically, we found a lot of groups of activists, people trying to, to I don't know, promote their, their, uh, their candidates, right? And this, if you think about, this is the ideal a uh, place for disseminate some fake news, some some misinformation, or some man that will affect the other side. Because if, if if you put this to activists, they don't care too much if it's true or false. They just want to support their candidates, right? They are activists. They are really trying to make that that guy to to get elected. And 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 we have found 350 groups. There there might be much more. We don't know too much how representative this data are, uh, uh, is of the entire WhatsApp, but it's, it's what could be done. And we realized this, this had some value. Uh, we showed to jo some journalists and they said, oh, this might be very useful for fact checking or something because we don't know what's going on inside the WhatsApp. And we created some sort of a trained topic, trained topic on WhatsApp. Every day you could see uh, what is the most shared image, the most shared videos, the most shared uh, 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 text and URLs and audios. That's the, the five things. And we start sharing with fact checkers. They, they, they start writing about, uh, they check the image and these things and say, oh, we gathered this data from this system from these guys. And, and journalists, we gave access to any journalist with uh, an editorial line. And, and, and this was a way, we, we removed any anything that could identify users inside those groups. We just we just provided uh, the content that was inside and that was very popular. Uh, let's say content that appeared in many groups. We show it to journalists. Now we open to, to research that are exploring this, this kind of data and more than 100 that I have access. So with this, we were trying to understand quickly what was going on, right? So now, now after that, the elections were last year. We, we wrote two papers on, on this topic. I will just show well, one of them describes the system, uh, and the second uh, describes some, some analysis on the, the top of the system that it did. I will just show one or another thing here, but basically we have found a lot of faked images, right? So in, in one side here, we have the ex-president Dilma uh, by, by the side of Fidel Castro and, and, and so on. This. Uh, this, they, this was checked, it was completely edited. The, the, it, it's not human. And the second one shows a guy who stabbed uh, both Jair Bolsonaro uh, during the campaign uh, in close to Lula, a former president in, in Brazil. So, uh, and this is also fake. This was an edited image. We found a lot of this case, but, but many of them were just misleading. An old image uh, of, of you know, an, an old mate taken out of context. But but what is interesting is that we got 
the 50 top inmates, the, the most shared inmates in this electoral period, and 88% of them were for fake or misleading. It was a lot, right? It was a kind of a flu deal. So I will just show one. I, I, unfortunately, the inmates are a bit, a bit hard to show in a talk, uh, but, but I, I need to show at least one. This is not exactly fake news. This is just saying, okay, if Bolsonaro wins, this is how schools are going to be. And if, if, if Adad wins, this is how schools are going to be. And this is what they're going to do with our kids and so on. This was the text that was close to this kind of image. And this is not exactly, there's no way for a fact checker uh, to check this because it's something that is saying about the future, right? It's not fake, right? And it is just a mem, and there was a lot of them. But the interesting part is that there was some sort of flooding of mems inside inside WhatsApp, and and we could see some sort of a orchestrated effort or something like this. Someone trying to flush a lot of information inside the groups. There are even here's a cell phone uh, receiving message uh, here, and this is from the, the the current Brazilian president. He is kind of bragging about. The many groups he is involved in, the amount of messages uh, are, are in memes are being shared inside the, those those groups. Um, I made as a gift, so it's going to repeat. If, if you don't understand this, every time an image and, and, and a meme or something arrives in a group, the group goes to the top, and that's why you see so many groups passing. So he might be connected in more in hundreds of of those groups, and this was how things happen here here in Brazil in terms of. Uh, misinformation. There was a lot of activity inside WhatsApp. Um, we were, we were, ha we had this project which is a bit different. In, we're not worrying too much about the, the papers last year. We were more worried about the elections. So uh, we tried to to write again an opinion that could somehow help the the, the elections to the debate to to continue without so much uh, fake news. And we wrote this opinion letter on New York Times uh, trying to suggest limits on, on the features that allow an information to get viral in WhatsApp, right? So we're basically suggesting the, to limit the, the forwarding. Uh, it was one of the things. And, and also, we're suggesting things for this electoral period, not, not permanent things, but the, the things that reduce virality, that wouldn't allow something to spread viral inside WhatsApp. Because then, then uh, discussions would be would be better. That's that's our point. Um, and and the article was we, we showed numbers about fake news uh, in this article as well. And two days later, WhatsApp the 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 repercussion was was quite quite big. Two days later, WhatsApp banned more than one hundred thousand accounts in Brazil, and 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 then. Um, a few months, but, but WhatsApp said they, they couldn't implement those chains uh, before the election, reduce uh, reduce forwarding and so on. And they, they wouldn't have time to, to do that quickly. But they did later, they did in January, they reduced the, the, the limits on, on message forwarding to five in the entire world. And we can see, as I, as I told, uh, this misinformation, fighting misinformation is some sort of a adversarial fight. So some of the things we pointed out, uh, people try to reproduce in other countries. And now WhatsApp uh, took, a, took a different approach. For example, in the Spanish election, they banned a bunch of accounts uh, uh, saying that they were, they were having uh, uh, automated activity. So imagine, imagine that, that, that image that I showed about from the president, from the Brazilian president, he was in so many groups at the same time. How can one person follow information in, in that way? There's no way. So uh, why why to not put some limit on those things, right? If someone starts to enter more than 100 groups in one day, you should just, just block their account. Probably that's what WhatsApp is starting to do. They suspended a lot of accounts here in Brazil as well recently. Um, and now we are exploring these things in terms of, of research papers. So this, this last paper we just did is can WhatsApp counter misinformation by limiting message forward? We, we created these uh, susceptible infected recovered mo uh, models and, and we tried Fabricio, to- Fabricio, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. Uh, we are at time. Do you have any final sure. thoughts for us to wrap up? Sure, this is my last slide. Uh, we, we 
it basically in this article we we were trying to see if these this limits uh, they they are effective and the main message is that uh, they are able to delay information but they are not able to to uh, to stop it uh, especially when it's viral so that's it um, I I think we did something a bit different here uh, in in Brazil. But I think that that's, that's the best way to counter misinformation. Of course, taking care to not enter into the fight, we're just providing transparency and not choosing one party or another, trying to stay away from, 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 from any side. But I, I think deploying those scissors really made us to understand the real problem. And I think we were able to help in the Facebook ad uh, uh, situation. And what was done in Brazil was something uh, successful. Uh, implemented by Facebook, and and but WhatsApp was was a big problem, and and there is still discussion about what to do uh, next. That's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's take one question now, and then uh, we'll have time at the end for uh, any additional questions that we have in the queue or that come up. Um, anything uh -huh. from IRC? So far, nothing from IRC or YouTube. Excellent. Anybody here in the room have any questions for Fabricio? Yeah, I have a, I have one question about uh, what you measure in also in the activity of uh, WhatsApp. It you think that main most of the attacks are made by using bots or some kind of technology or or their click farms. What is your the, what, what are you learning from the procedure of attackers? Because this is something that, that might be affecting us later. I, I think they are they are professionals. Uh, some some let's say someone working the campaigns, uh, like freelancers, journalists, something like this, creating the memes. And there are evidences from from um, a journalist kind of raised this story, saying that there was some automatic way to push content inside a lot of groups at the same time. So it seems that it was, let's say, OK, let's create some memes, 20 memes in a day, something. Some group of professionals just do this kind of things easily. And, and then it's clearly pushed by, by, by some automatic mechanism that, that flood uh, public groups and all those groups of activists quickly. And then these guys are activists. They, they work some, as some sort of a backbone of misinformation, right? They really are going to share. And these guys are, are real people. They're going to share that information to their friends, to the private groups. And that's how, how things get in the end to, to everyone. Cool. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you once again, Fabricio. So our next uh, our next speaker up, our next guest speaker, is Francesca Spezzano from Boise State University. And Francesca is going to be presenting research on pr protecting Wikipedia from disinformation, detecting malicious editors and pages to protect. Um, and I believe, Francesca, this is based on uh, kind of a, a series of, of research uh, investigations and systems that you've been working on with collaborators over the last few years. Um, with that, I'll hand it to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Jordan. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, present my research. Yes, as you said, uh, this is an overview of uh, the research that I've been doing in the past five years. Um, can you guys see my sh screen? Yep, and we can see your slides. OK, so as everybody knows, uh, Wikipedia is the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Uh, because it's free, uh, everyone can access it. So Wikipedia has a large reach. And uh, these days, is the major, major source of information for many. Uh, however, because of these uh, openness features such that anyone can edit, uh, this feature makes it very easy for malicious users to compromise, compromise the article quality of uh, Wikipedia. Uh, and in particular, there are uh, many types of uh, malicious editors that are uh, working on Wikipedia. Um, 
and compromise the content, including uh, vandals, spammers, uh, which sometimes also use sock puppet accounts. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about this type of users and how it's possible to detect them. So there are many uh, forms of disinformation in Wikipedia. The main one and the big umbrella one is vandalism. So basically vandalism as defined by Wikipedia itself is the act of editing the project in a malicious manner that is intentionally disruptive. So basically what vandals do, they uh, add, remove or modify text on Wikipedia pages by adding content that is uh, most of the times nonsensical, humorous, or it's also uh, offensive. Uh, there are different, uh, many examples of vandalism on Wikipedia. Uh, for instance, in this case, the first love of thermodynamics uh, uh, page has been modified with the sentence that the first law of thermodynamics is not to talk about thermodynamics. So this is a clear um, act of vandalism. Uh, another example is, for instance, the Wikipedia page of the actor Charlie uh, Sheen uh, has been changed such that it says that this man is a uh, half man and half cocaine. Uh, another form of this information is spam, and Wikipedia recognizes three types of spams, uh, which are basically uh, creating art articles that are promoting uh, some particular entity, it can be a person or it can also be a business, and uh, sometimes these edits are also uh, paid, so somebody is paid for writing this type of articles, and uh, uh, the payment is not disclosed, so this is going to be a conflict of interest and it's going to be a problem. Uh, we also have external link spamming, uh, for instance, uh, we have an example here. And another form of spam, it's adding references with the aim of promoting the author or the work being referenced. Uh, of course, um, spam does not influence only the text. Uh, for instance, this day there has been a um, big scandal from the North Face companies where basically these people took uh, photographs of, of uh, very popular outdoor destinations and in these photos they uh, put people wearing their clothes or equipments and then they put these images on the pages of the locations uh, on Wikipedia. So basically they did a kind of uh, image spamming. Finally, uh, another form of Wikipedia are hoaxes, which are basically articles that are uh, deceptively created to present in false information as a fact. Uh, for instance, uh, there have been a page about Olimar the Wonder Cat, which is clearly something that does not exist. And the problem with hoaxes is that even though the majority of them uh, are deleted very quickly by the Wikipedia administrator, uh, some of them, they can last for a longer time, even for eight, nine years, or also 10 years. So what is Wikipedia uh, currently doing, trying to protect the, the project? Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, mechanisms that Wikipedia is using. Uh, first of all, Wikipedia relies on the users and the good editors. Uh, there are different roles. For instance, we have the rollbackers that are users who can quickly revert changes uh, done by other users in case they are uh, malicious. We have the patrollers, which are gatekeepers who monitor uh, recent, recent changes in some given pages. We have watch listers, so every Wikipedia user has a self-selected watch list of articles and they are notified when one is modified so they can watch out for uh, potential uh, disinformation added to these pages. And finally, if nobody is able to catch uh, um, this kind of uh, misinformation or disinformation in this case in Wikipedia, uh, it will reach the readers and um, they can eventually um, notify the administrator uh, if they encounter such disinformation. Uh, other ways are there are some bots, tools, or blacklists that Wikipedia uses. Uh, for instance, we have Cluebot NG, which is a bot that analyzes the content of the edits, scores the edits, 
and reverse uh, the worst scoring edits. And this is mainly used for uh, detecting vandalism. Also for vandalism, we have uh, Sticky, which is a tool that uh, suggests potential vandalism to humans for a definitive classification. Recently, uh, Wikimedia Foundation launched uh, the web the ORES, which is a web service uh, scoring system uh, to detect the damaging edits, and uh, it can detect spam or vandalism. And finally, we also have link spam blacklists, which basically are a mechanism that reject edits, uh, adding prohibited URLs to the Wikipedia pages. Uh, another mechanism is uh, page protection. Uh, which basically um, it's a way to placing restrictions to the type of users that can edit a page. And we're gonna talk about it uh, uh, today. And moreover, we also have account blocking. So if uh, uh, there are users uh, who keep damaging Wikipedia, uh, these users are first warned and then eventually after a few warns, they are blocked and they can be blocked temporarily or indefinitely. Uh, and the block can also apply to IP ranges in case of uh, we have an attack from uh, a group of sock puppets account. Uh, of course, uh, administrators have a lot of work to do because they, are, they have the privilege to uh, protect the page or block the users. Uh, so. Uh, they are doing all this work manually. So we as researchers, we try to um, define some automatic solutions that can uh, help them to manage all this work. So overall, uh, what are the research efforts that the community uh, has investigated during these years? Uh, first of all, they investigated the problem of detecting uh, this information directly. So a lot of work has been done for detecting uh, vandalism. And this work also inspired the uh, design of bots like Sticky and Clubbot NG for detect vandalism. Uh, also, some work has been done for link spamming and also for detecting uh, hoaxes. Uh, another type of research where I, I worked on focused on detecting the deceivers, so trying to detect uh, the users that are vandals, which are the ones that make incoherent and destructive edits on Wikipedia. Uh, also, I've worked on detecting spammers, um, which are the users who unsolicitedly promote some entity. And other people have worked on detecting uh, soft puppet accounts, which are basically um, multiple accounts operated by the same users. and. Uh, uh, they are often used to deceive because the malicious users uh, use it uh, mainly to circumvent a block or a ban posted by a Wikipedia administrator or even to harass uh, other users. And finally, another uh, line of research I've worked on in the last few years, it's about page protection and detect pages that should be protected uh, automatically. So I will start by introducing uh, my research about detecting uh, bundles and spammers on Wikipedia. So I will start from uh, bundles. So the first thing we did here is try to study how do bundles behave in Wikipedia and try to capture their behavior. Uh, so first of all, we built a data set. So we collected um, a set of uh, half spam and half bundles uh, by using the Wikipedia APIs. And these are all users who um, joined Wikipedia between January 13 and January uh, 2014. And given that we had this data set, we tried to study what is the behavior of these uh, malicious actors. So what we found is that basically uh, benign users edit more non-article pages than bundles, even in their first, first edit. And by non-article page, I mean uh, pages like the user page of the user or talk page of the, um, uh, of the article. So basically, benign users are trying to build their profile on Wikipedia and also uh, engage in discussions to decide what, which kind of content should be on the page. And this is something that uh, bundles do not do. 
Also, we noticed that vandals spend less time in editing uh, a new page, uh, while uh, Wikipedia editors, they, the genuine one, they, they, they think more and they spend more time in deciding what they have to write. And also, uh, of course, they make faster edits than benign users because their intent is just to uh, go on the page and write the sentence, the nonsensical sentence they want to add. Um, so they can do this stuff uh, fast. So uh, what we did, uh, it's basically we designed views, which is a, a vandals early warning system. So we tried to catch uh, Wikipedia vandals as soon as possible. So uh, we designed uh, two models that basically are using the edit sequence of the users. Um, so each editor has a sequence of edits uh, in his head history. And what we did, we created some features that are basically are describing two pairs of consecutive edits. And we took into account uh, dimensions as the time, so how much time elapsed between these two consecutive edits. Um, was the second edit uh, a normal page or it was a user of talk page, for instance? Uh, is this one the first edit of the user or not? Um, what is the distance between these two pages in the Wikipedia hyperlink network? And that, do these two pages have categories in common? So given that we have this representation for the edit history of each user, we designed two models. So one model was about uh, understanding if uh, some uh, particular patterns were present or not in the, um, uh, in, the, um, in the sequence representing the edit history of the user. And another one was about uh, understanding how uh, users were moving from one state to another one. So we tested our system on the data set that we built. Um, so of course, the combination of the two models, which constitutes wheels, uh, it's the best. Uh, uh, it achieves the best accuracy. Uh, what we can say is that we can detect uh, bundles with 78% of accuracy by just looking at the first edit. Uh, in 44% of the cases, uh, the bundle can be identified before its first reversion. Also, on average, uh, views detects bundles 2.4 edits before uh, Cluebot and G. Uh, and finally, if we consider all the uh, edit history of the users, we can reach uh, an accuracy of 88%. We mm -hmm. also compared our approach with uh, Cluebot and G and mm -hmm. views, and we showed that we outperform these two uh, baselines. So along these lines, I also studied the, ca the case of uh, spammer detections in Wikipedia. So again, we built a data set with half spam and half benign users. Um, we collected the ground truth about the spam users directly on Wikipedia because there are uh, blacklists which are uh, listing um, uh, users that are blocked for spamming or for from link, link spamming. So we used this list for our ground truth. And then we defined some features for uh, describing the behavior of the users. So we considered features about the, um, the edit size, um, the size of the edit, the, the, how much time elapsed between two edits, um, if there were links or not in their edits, uh, whether or not they were editing a talk page, and also, we consider some features about the username. So basically, um, the way malicious users are creating their username can also contain information that says that these users are suspicious. So if we look at the top three features uh, for detecting spammers in Wikipedia, uh, we notice that uh, the three most important ones are the link ratio, the average size of edit, and the standard deviation of time between edits, which basically means that spammers are using more links in their edits. They have a smaller um, average size, and they also they edit faster than uh, benign users. 
Uh, also interesting, they, they are also editing uh, talk pages, which can be because they want to have uh, visibility also on those pages, or maybe because administrators are trying to block them, uh, so they are trying to respond on their talk page to these administrators. And also we see that uh, username-based features were useful uh, because they can increase the uh, accuracy prediction by 3%, so they are also important. So we tested our approach on the dataset that we build, and we tested different uh, classifiers. So the best one is performing with an accuracy of 80%, and the mean average precision of 88, and uh, uh, also it works if we consider an unbalanced setting, because in the reality we have way more less spammers than in users. Uh, again, we compare it with ORES by considering the average and maximum ORES damaging score among all the users' edits, and we show that we can improve the performance of ORES, however, ORES is important because if we combine our features with ORES, we can further improve the accuracy of our system. So uh, finally, another uh, topic that we, uh, we have addressed, it's about detecting uh, pages to protect. So again, uh, administrators may decide to protect a page by restricting the access only to good users, mainly because the page has been heavily vandalized or because of libel or edit warning uh, happening on the page. And people can recognize um, protected pages because of the lock symbol in the top right corner of the Wikipedia page. So if there is the lock, uh, not everybody is allowed to edit the page. So regarding the policy, there are different levels of page protection. So we have fully protected pages, which can be only uh, moved or edited by administrators. Um, we have semi-protected pages where they can be edited only by auto-confirmed users. And also we have the move protection policy uh, where um, pages are not allowed to be moved to a new title. And also page protection can be set for forever, or it can be shorter, so just for 24 hours or 36 hours. So the problem is that administrators are doing all this work manually, so uh, we, want to, uh, we wanted to design a system that was able to at least suggest them uh, which pages to watch out. So we designed a DAP that was uh, the first system to decide if we have to protect or not a Wikipedia page. Uh, again, we used the features that are looking at the, um, uh, the, the page revision behavior, which is basically how the editors are editing uh, Wikipedia. So there, are, there is a group of editors that is editing uh, this page fast or uh, these editors uh, are editing from mobile devices or something like that. And also we considered uh, page categories uh, as a proxy for the page topic because there are more categories uh, that are more susceptible to be uh, vandalized. Uh, and also we try to understand if the behavior of the users on those pages was anomal anomalous with respect to the category of the page or not. Uh, so the advantage of this system is that we don't look at textual content in the sense that we don't use NLP uh, features, so because the aim was that to design something that can be used on different uh, language versions of Wikipedia, uh, along the lines of uh, uh, when we tried to detect the malicious users, uh, we, the behavior is something that is, uh, does not depend on the language, so potentially can scale on uh, all the language versions of Wikipedia. So uh, we build, because we wanted to test on multiple languages, we build four datasets for Wikipedia English, German, French, and Italian. In these datasets, we collected all the protected pages uh, up to October 2016, and also an equal numbers of randomly selected unprotected pages. Uh, so how, how we can see from the side of these datasets, 
Of course, the larger uh, is the version of Wikipedia, the higher is the number of uh, pages that uh, have been protected. So we tested our system uh, and we show that we can reach at least 93% accuracy uh, across all the languages that we analyzed. And also we can do better than some baselines. Uh, as baselines, basically we consider the number of revisions as possible level or vandalism. Uh, we consider the revisions from the bots that are fighting vandalism. So we have Flubot and Sticky for uh, Wikipedia English, Sailbot for, for French Wikipedia, and we were not able to find any tool for German or Italian. So we assume all the work has been uh, done manually to protect these two uh, Wikipedia from uh, vandalism or other kind of damaging edits. And finally, we also consider the, the number of edit wars uh, on the page. So these baselines, they, they do well uh, on English and French with an accuracy of 80% and 77%, um, but our system is able to outperform uh, these numbers. Also, because the page can be protected because of edit wars, uh, we try to, to understand if there is uh, um, any connection with, between controversial topics and uh, page protection, uh, because edit wars happens a lot on controversial, to controversial topics. Um, so we pick a data set where basically uh, uh, people have annotated the controversy level of the page uh, but we find out that given the controversy level of the page, it's not always true that we have to uh, protect the page. So uh, there is no connection between um, controversial topics and page protection. Also, we checked the page popularity. So we wanted to check if, uh, in case the page is more popular, if we should protect. There is higher probability that we have to protect the page. And in this case, we got better uh, results than the controversy level. So in this case, it's, it's true that um, if the page uh, receive more views, then the, uh, the chances that we have to protect the pages is higher, of course, because uh, vandals can reach uh, uh, a lot of people uh, because a lot of people are reading those pages. So using page popularity as a baseline for predicting uh, page protection is achieves a higher uh, accuracy than the controversy level. So in conclusion, uh, we have that people trust and read the Wikipedia every day. So there is the need to protect the Wikipedia from this information. Uh, my research in the last five years uh, focused on uh, the definition of DAP, which is a system for automatic detecting uh, pages to protect in Wikipedia, and that also works uh, across multiple languages. Uh, in the future, we may think about um, trying to predict for how long we should protect the pages instead, so going beyond the um, binary classification of whether or not we have to protect the page. Let's try to predict for how long. And also, uh, I have shown that uh, we can use behavioral modeling for uh, detecting malicious editors in Wikipedia, such as vandals and spammers. So when we try to uh, detect the vandals or also spammers, there is the problem that the veteran editors uh, suspiciously look at newcomers as potential vandals and delete their contribution, even though they are good paid editors. So this causes uh, many social barriers in the newcomers uh, because they don't feel they are well integrated in the community. And after some time, they end up st uh, stop editing and leave uh, the community. So as future work, I would like to try to improve, improve these malicious editor detector detection tools uh, by defining tools that, yes, they can uh, detect malicious users as soon as possible, but also we have to uh, reduce the false positives because we want to retain um, good users and new contributors in the encyclopedia. So thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um,
So starting with IRC and YouTube, do we have any questions for the speakers? Yeah, we have a question from IRC for Francesca. Um, I think having to do with the vandal fighting uh, work, there is some confusion around some of the statistics and just trying to get a better sense of, uh, of the answers. Um, so the question was specifically, what does it mean to say that only 44% of vandals can be caught before the first reversion? The model has 78% accuracy on the first edit. So basically, we find, found out that um, whether or not the, the first edit is on, a, on an article or um, like a meta page, like a user page or a talk page, this mm -hmm. is a strong indicator of whether the user is a vandal or not. So vandals don't spend time in defining the profile on Wikipedia. They immediately go and um, uh, edit the, the page they want to vandalize. Uh, so if we just look at the first edit, we have 70% uh, of accuracy. Uh, we show that we can detect um, those bundles within the, uh, basically before uh, the um, I user is, is doing the first reversion of the malicious content. Okay, thank you. And also, is there a pointer towards like precision recall data paper that we can share out perhaps? Uh, yes, all the information is on the paper. Okay, great. Find everything there, yeah. Um, Any questions from here in the room? There's another uh, question. Uh, okay, go, go ahead. Well, let's, you go. You go ahead first, Diego, because I know the other question is from the same person as the first question. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, my question it is um, <laughs> there. There are two questions. Um, so your studies were uh, mainly on the English Wikipedia, or have you done any study in other wikis? And if this is the case, also, if you have a sense of there's uh, this kind, this kind of behavior will differ depending on the on the project or in the edition that people this work. So the studies on the users, uh, they have been done only on English Wikipedia. Uh, the study on page protection has been done on four uh, language versions of Wikipedia. Um, I guess that the behavior is something that is more um, unique and it's constant across languages. So um, as we found in the case of page protection. Um, so I think that, yes, that Checking the behavior can scale can scale more uh, across different languages than, for instance, just checking the content of the um, damaging edit. Thank you. Excellent, Fabricio. I thought maybe you had a question. Do you have a question? You mean if I, no, I I don't. Okay. Um, I had a question for you, um, and then maybe we can switch back to the, uh, the other question on IRC. Um, so uh, in your work, Fabricio, you were looking at, um, so you, you had access to some public WhatsApp groups um, or, or groups that you defined as public. And I think you, you kind of, you described the, an interesting tension when, when doing research on these kinds of semi-public quasi-public, quasi-private platforms. Um, I wondered if, you, if you're thinking about your next work, um, what are some of the things that you're considering in terms of both the logistical challenges of doing research on, on private or encrypted social media spaces and also how you're thinking about the ethics of it? I think that personally, I think that what your your rationale makes a lot of sense. But I'm curious to think about how, if you want to keep doing research in this space, what are some of the considerations that you have? Unmute. Okay. So yeah, I, I, it's it's a great question. We we thought a lot about exploring uh, these public groups or not, right? Uh, we decided to. To explore only the content. We don't even save information that is 
can identify uh, users, and and we attempt to to provide um, in the system the popular content that appear in, let's say, in many groups, right? To the journalists for two reasons. First, it was an information of public interest, right? And second, uh, what defines what is private and and public uh, in a system that that conversations can see? It's a kind of paradox of the way the system works. You have private conversations, but they can go viral and become public. Ultimately, they can reach the entire network, right? We're just we're just helping journalists to get a sense of what was happening in terms of showing them the very popular images, the very popular uh, uh, videos, and so on, so that so that they could check, right? Of course, of course, uh, we needed to deal with this all the time. For example, journalists was, were were definitely asking for, okay, who made this message? Who has shared those things? Or we are not even saving these things, and so on. We needed to answer this to a bunch of people. We needed to... So you have the opportunity, let's say, to, to, to cross these lines, and, and we kind of define it, what would be our goal, where we could uh, uh, provide something that was uh, useful for the election, useful for, for us to learn the, the, the problem, to understand the problem without crossing uh, some line. But, but we were touching somehow in this gray area. Right, we yeah, were that's a, in this gray area. It's a complicated issue. We decided to. We decided. Yeah, to no, I think it highlights a, a tension that we all have to wrestle with. Um, so thank yeah. you for sharing that. Um, we have, yeah, let's do one more question. So I know that uh, that Aaron Havager had another question on IRC, and uh, let's let's close with that question. How about that? Yeah, so the second question then is around page protection, uh, Francesca, and it's asking kind of about the features that you you were using in that uh, problem, like how you formulated the, the problem, as well as more specifically, like temporally, how, uh, I assume you only use features up to the point at which the page was protected, but just some more details around that as well. Yeah, also if the page has been protected many times, we just considered the edits uh, between the two protections. So we did not inject twice the, the ground truth. Um, so features that we consider, uh, basically they look at how the users are editing uh, the page. So for instance, we consider uh, what is the average time between revisions. So are they editing fast or slowly? Um, what What is the total number of users that are making uh, revisions? Um, what's the average number, average number of revisions per user? if their users are registered users or not, maybe they are, um, they are um, editing from mobile devices, it's more likely that they are vandals. Uh, and also what's the average size of revision. So it's kind of um, similar behavior to the ones of the vandals. Uh, and also uh, we considered those features uh, over time to see if uh, there is some kind of anomaly at some point uh, about these features. And also if those features are somehow anomalous uh, with respect to the category the page belongs to. And we choose the categories because they, they can describe somehow the topic of the page and they can also be translated across uh, different Wikipedias. So uh, yeah, the, the intent was to do something that was uh, language independent. And then we basically did a binary classification between protected pages and non-protected pages. Awesome. Well, that is it for us today at the Wikimedia Research Showcase. I wanted to thank again our presenters, Fabricio Benvenuto and Francesca Spezzano. Um, and thanks everybody else who makes this possible every month. Um, just one procedural note for everybody. In the upcoming weeks, we're going to be releasing a survey um, to ask for feedback from our audiences on how we can improve the showcase in 2020. So keep your eye out for that. Um, anybody who 
who has a stake in the showcase, whether you're a former presenter or whether you're a regular viewer or a staff member or a community volunteer, we want to hear from you. Um, so keep an eye out for that on various mailing lists, and I'll be advertising at the showcase next month as well, which will be Wednesday, November 20th, same time. And with that, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you both. It was wonderful having you.